Amen, amen. Open up your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 2. I just had to tweet my man Adam, Pastor Adam, had me cracking up. Everybody got presents on Christmas, Jesus' birthday except Jesus. I think that's funny. Hey, man, I just want to keep it real with you guys. I don't celebrate Christmas. It means absolutely nothing to me, and I'm going to tell you why. Because this culture makes me want to puke when I see the consumerism that they get into around this season. If you can have Christmas without being a consumeristic, selfish, me-centered American, I am so happy for you. God bless you. Enjoy it and do it. Give to your children and enjoy it. If you cannot do it, do what I did and cut that whole thing out because it is a cancer to our society. Jesus never told us to celebrate his birth. He told us to understand the resurrection. He never told us to give presents to each other in a greedy fashion, making us expect something from each other. He told us to lay down our lives and preach the gospel to one another. He never told our children to believe in some Santa Claus, that's some make-believe myth, like some Greek god of the past that would bring trees under your idol, I mean, give, bring gifts under your idol called a Christmas tree. It's all pagan. He didn't tell us to do that. He taught our children to be raised up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Now, because I'm your pastor and I don't want to force my beliefs on you, I'm not going to talk about why I don't celebrate Christmas today. And probably one of the only churches that Christmas time comes, less people come because they know something like this is going to happen. And that's all right because I ain't got nothing to be ashamed of. I'll stand before Jesus on Judgment Day and say, Lord, I told him. I told him on America, I told Americans on Sunday what Jesus, what I felt you were saying. We didn't make you know, cute Christmas albums and sell it to them and make weird doctrines to sell it off to them. God, I just told them what you said, Philippians chapter 2. If, if you're going to celebrate Christmas, if you're going to have something that you do December 25th, can I at least help you understand why Jesus came to this earth? Can I do that as your pastor? Can I at least help you understand why Jesus came? Why would Jesus come for us? Who is Jesus? Do you know that some people think Jesus was born that day that he never existed? I want to talk about some of that today. Who is Jesus? Why did he come? The concept in doctrinal terms we call it is the hypostatic union. Everybody say hypostatic union. Once again, just a little check mark in your mind. My pastor is crazy. Sunday morning, Chris, hypostatic union. Yes, you're going to learn doctrine today. Amen? I'm going to stop talking about how crazy I am and just be crazy. Amen? Okay, but I just, just want to let you know if you're thinking that, I know you're thinking that, and I'm still okay with that. Philippians 2, chapter 1 through 11, it says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each one of you should not look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Everybody say, my attitude should be the same of Christ Jesus. Amen. Verse 6 is one of the oldest hymns in the Bible. It's called the Carmen Christi. It predates even Paul's writings itself. This is a testimony that Christians always believed in the deity of Jesus even before the New Testament was written. They sang songs about him before they wrote about him. Are you listening? This is what is called the Carmen Christi. The hymn, Carmen is, is Latin for him. The hymn to Christ who being in very nature God, not considering equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can somebody say, Amen. Amen. Isn't that a good song? That's the kind of song you want to sing, right? What I want to talk to you today about is Christ coming to this earth. For you to understand who Christ is and why he came to this earth. Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, said, I want nothing to do with Christ and a mass to him on that day by the definition of Catholicism and Roman popery. 
Not popery like what you make and burn in your house, but Pope doctrine mentality. He said, I don't want anything to do with that. He said, but I want everything to do with Christ and his incarnation. I would ask of you today, we celebrate 4th of July, we celebrate other things that aren't biblical, I get it, but I would ask of you, if you're going to make a day about him, would you really make the day about him? Would you really make the day about him, Jesus? Would you teach your neighbors, your friends, maybe a little nicer than how I am right now, would you teach them about the reason for the season? Would you explain it to them in terms they can understand? Dito Jesus wasn't created the day he came into a manger. Point number one, God the Son has always existed with the Father. Equal in divine attributes, all-knowing, all-powerful, never-present. Will you turn with me to John chapter 1, verses 14 and 18 and onward? I just want you to look at it quickly. And as you're turning there, just pray that that uh, screwed spirit don't come out anymore. Amen? Come on. Turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 1. I want you to know who Jesus is. So many people think that they understand about him, but when you get into the details of uh, their belief about Jesus, they actually believe heresy, which is unbiblical truth. Excuse me. Many times we think about Jesus being created that day. He wasn't created that day. He had always existed. It says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. We see in verse 2, he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So the first thing you have to understand about the word here, who it's talking about, the Logos, the Son of God, who we know as Jesus, he has always existed in eternity. He was the creator of this world. The Father used Jesus to make us. We are made in his image. Did you know that you're made in the Son of God's image? You are made, think about this, I am made in the Son of God's image. You are made like Jesus. Then keep going, verse 14 talks about why he came. You see, if you notice, the book of John doesn't go into the story of the manger, doesn't go into the story of Mary and all of this. Why does the book of John go right there in chapter 1, in the beginning was the word? In has logos in the Greek, there was nothing but word, and the word was with the Father, and the Father and the word are God. Why does it take you right to this theological picture of what's going on in all of eternity? It's because he's taking for granted John the Apostle writing his gospel at the end of his life. He's taking for granted you've already heard the story of the manger. You've already understood the wise men. You've already understood the virgin birth. And now you need to get the picture from heaven who Jesus was and has always been you need to get that in your heart and that's today for us is it not we keep reciting the story over and over and over again and we make out these things and praise god we have mangers and all i mean i get it because at least we're not making mangers for zeus and hercules and whatever false god and for you know for a few moments the guy puts down his six pack turns off the game and spends time with his kids i mean i'm happy for those kinds of things but does he really understand the jesus he's talking about because it's kind of our habit to get caught up in caricatures, you know, these, these pictures that we have, this image, and we just, we, we just think Jesus is that forever baby, you know, like Family Guy, that forever little baby that's on there. I don't watch it, I've just heard about it. You know, that, that little baby, or the Simpsons, that forever baby, that, and then Jesus is just forever that little baby. John says he is our creator. Look at verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. See, this is what is beautiful about our God is that he comes to dwell with us. And then look what it says. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. 
That means that Jesus' assignment and what he was going to do was going to be full of two things. Whenever you would look at Jesus, you would see two things. You would see grace. You would see forgiveness. You would see undeserved, unmerited gifts being brought to you. And you would see truth just being brought to you over and over and over again. And when the truth kept whapping you upside the head and spanking your spiritual behind, and you would feel like you would just need some more loving, grace would come, grace would come. And then when you would think it was all just about love and ooey gooey and sitting back and doing nothing, then truth would come and truth and grace and grace and truth is what he was full of and then it says in verse 18 no one has ever seen God but God the one and only everybody say God the one and only see one and only is what begotten really means a lot of times we think of begotten as being that uh, birth is a created sense of what only begotten son. But what, one in, what begotten means is one and only brought forth. It's not necessary to Jesus that he had to be created be, to be the begotten son. How he's the only begotten son is that he's the one and only person of God that came forth into human history. He was begotten into human history because no one has ever seen God the Father. Moses never saw God the Father. Elijah, Gideon, Abraham, none of them saw God the Father. The one that would come forth and speak to them would be Jesus. And then at a certain time in human history, he comes in into the world of flesh and now takes on that flesh. And the people saw him. They saw his glory. And by seeing his glory, they got to see God. But not God the Father, because no one can see him and live. But God the one and only, the one and only begotten, the one and only brought forth from heaven. That's why he said to people, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It says, who is at the Father's side has made him known. The first point that I want you to get today in, in our lesson about Jesus is that Jesus has always existed. He has all the divine attributes of God. Because when we say God, you know, I believe in God, what we're talking about is a being that is all-powerful, can do anything. That's our God, right? Is all-knowing, knows everything, knows what you're thinking even before you think it, and is ever-present, is everywhere we go. When we say that is our God, Jesus has all of those attributes. The hypostatic union, this theological term, refers to the joining of the Son of God, his divinity, with flesh, human nature. I want to say that again. The hypostatic union is when the Son of God, forever dwelling in heaven as a spirit, because that's who he was before he came. He's always existed. Are you guys tracking with me? The hypostatic union says at the incarnation, when the power of the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, God joined himself with flesh. The word hypostasis is the Greek word for substance or nature. Everybody say hypostasis. That word is found in Hebrews 1, 3, talking about this is the hypostasis of Jesus. This is the nature of Jesus. Now, all of us have hypostasis. You are of the human hypostasis. Your nature is human. Are you a human being? Can I hear an amen? But when we're talking about Jesus, he has a nature that is not like ours because he is two natures in one. He is fully God and he is fully man. He is 100% God and 100% man. Sometimes people like to think that Jesus was half God and half man, or that when he came down as man, he stopped being God. No, but the uniqueness about Jesus is that he is fully God and fully man, and they join together at that incarnation inside of Mary's womb because we believe life begins at conception, are you all listening to me? So Jesus, his divinity, his eternal spirit, which had always existed before creation, before the world was ever formed, before there was ever a universe, it was the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That Jesus came into the womb of Mary, joined himself with flesh to be something that could never be replicated or duplicated, the God-man. 100% God, 100% man. The Bible talks about in Matthew 1.18 that when Mary became 
pregnant that they would call him Jesus, which means Yahweh saves, but his Old Testament fulfillment of prophecy, Isaiah 9, he would be called Emmanuel, God with us. Here's some uh, clarifications when we talk about the hypostatic union, the nature of Christ joining divine and human together. Here's some clarifications. God the Son was never created. Everybody say he always existed. Thank you. He always existed. He simply took on flesh to dwell with mankind. Now, could have Jesus come down like angels came down? Aren't angels spirits as well? The Bible teaches us. Couldn't Jesus have just come down as a spirit? Yes, he could. As a matter of fact, he visited with Moses as a spirit. He came and he spoke to Abraham as a spirit. He did these things spiritually. So why would he have to take on flesh? For the redemption of mankind. You see, for the redemption of mankind, there needed to be a sacrifice. And from the very beginning, when God spoke to Abraham and said, I'll give you a son of promise, Abraham understood that because one man, Adam, had brought sin to the world, one man needs to sacrifice himself for the sins of the world. And so when God said to Abraham, sacrifice your son Isaac, in his mind he was going to kill his child. Why? To make up for the sins of the world. You ever wonder where human sacrifice came from? It's actually rooted in biblical theology. It's just man's way of trying to do it. You know, we have sin in our village, so there's a pure virgin. She is the most unspotted by sin that we can think of. Let us throw her in the volcano. Let us sacrifice her, and maybe the gods or God will hold back the plague, hold back the destruction. But you see, Jesus never taught them to do that. What he wanted to do was show them a type and a shadow of that because at the very first understanding with Abraham about ready to sacrifice his son Isaac, what happens? God shows up and says, I myself will provide the lamb. He reveals himself as Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And he steadies Abraham's hand and he says, don't do it. Here is a ram in the thicket. And then from that point on, animal sacrifice was supposed to be the representation of the human sacrifice that would one day come from Jehovah Jireh, the God himself who would provide. So why did Jesus have to take on flesh? Because Jesus was coming to be a sacrifice. Can't sacrifice a spirit. You can't put the angel Gabriel out there and sacrifice him. So God himself says, I will come and take on flesh. So the Father sends him. Number two. Mary wasn't sinless. This is the false Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Anybody ever hear that before? That Mary was sinless? Everybody go, "Uh -uh." false doctrine. (laughs) She was a sinner like all mankind. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You'll never find this teaching in Scripture. It's make-believe. Therefore, Mary was chosen to bring forth the Son of God by how? The power of the Holy Spirit, not by her own nature or righteousness. So Mary is a sinner that needed to be born again, just like you needed to be born again, and I need to be born again. This idea that Mary has some special place over the rest of humans, that she can now be a mediator or co-mediator, as some Catholics say, between us and God is a devil's lie. A devil has told us to pray to other things called idols other than Jesus. Demons make these up so that men will be distracted and not give their attention to Jesus. Anything other than prayers to Jesus is prayers to demons and to satanic forces. And when you see these things appear, whether it's a bleeding statue or whether it's your relative from so-and-so uh, from way back when, these are demons, demons who want to replace Jesus, replace the attention of Jesus, and make it about them. That's why when you get around those who are superstitious and believe this way, Jesus gets pushed back into the corner, and these idols, these things get placed above Jesus. 
They pray more to Mary than they do to Jesus. They pray more to, at this statue and to this way and this way than they do to pray the way Jesus prayed. Superstition, it's, it's devilish, it's wrong. Number three, the Father didn't become Jesus. The Father and the Son are separate persons, yet one divine being. The Father sent the person of the Son to become man. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Because a lot of people teach that because we always say Jesus is God, Jesus is God, and the Father is God, and the Father is God, that this means that the Father became Jesus. That is not true. What we are saying about God is that God is three divine persons in one. The first thing that we look at when we look at the Bible to understand God is we see that God is not like us, and there's no one in heaven like him or on the earth. So we're going to fail to find examples to show the Trinity in heaven and on earth because there's nobody like him in heaven and on earth. So I don't want to give you an example to point to like water and say water becomes steam, ice, and liquid. This is like the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Or like St. Patrick in the clover leaf to show three different parts of the leaf into one. Or to show you an egg, the shell, the yolk, or the middle part. I'm not going to give you an example like that because the Bible forbids me to do so. To make anything in his image is a sin. And then to say anything is like him in heaven and earth we're not supposed to do. But I will help you wrap your mind around the Trinity as best as I can from Scripture. The first thing we hear from Scripture is we shouldn't compare them to anything. But then we see in Scripture that there are three divine persons that claim divinity. We look into the Old Testament and we see that there is the Father speaking forth as God. That's who we see as who God is. But then he begins to send his representative, his son. And we begin to see this in Daniel and the prophets later on in Israel's history. And yet he, the son, gets worship as well. Then when Jesus comes and says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father because we're the same in nature, he then says, I'm going to send another in my name who will be with you, the Holy Spirit. And where he is, the Father and myself will be. So then he attributes the Holy Spirit to being of the same substance, the same divine attributes as himself and the Father. So by the time you get done reading the Bible, you get to Revelations, you see the Father's on the throne, at his right hand is his Son receiving worship, and from the throne flows the Spirit of God like a river. You see the image of our triune God. Are you listening to me? But right here in the Old Testament, because sometimes Muslims and others like this tell us, well, you know, I worship God the way Abraham did. I worship God the way Daniel did. They didn't worship Jesus. They didn't worship the Holy Spirit. They just worshiped the Father. But that's not true. Are you with me in Daniel 7? We'll go up just a little bit. Uh, sorry, 13, that's good. Thank you, sir. It says, in my, night, uh, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days. Now, the Ancient of Days, we know, is there is the Father. And that's why, let's just say we go up to verse 11, bro. Let's give them a little bit of context here. Daniel is well before the birth of Jesus, hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. And this is what he sees. He says, then I continue to watch the boastful words of those that were slain. Give me just a second because uh, I want to go up further. I believe it's Daniel chapter uh, 7, verse 9. I want to show you more of the context here of Jesus, uh, excuse me, rather the, the Ancient of Days. Look at um, Daniel chapter 7. And look with me into, uh, as a matter of fact, look at verse 9. This is where it starts. It says, as I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Now, who did Daniel suspect the Ancient of Days to be? God. And how did he know God? Who was God to the Israelites? What did he call himself to them? Their father. He called Israel his child, his firstborn. So in his mind, Ancient of Days is God the Father. There's no other person of God. There's only the Father. Are you guys listening to me? His clothing was as white as snow, his hair as white as wool. His throne was flaming with fire. At his wheels they were all ablaze. A river of fly, fire was flowing and coming out from him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the court was, was seated and the books were open. 
So here we see that there is a judgment about ready to take place. The Father is sitting on a throne, and fire is coming before him. I could make an argument of the Holy Spirit being that fire, but I would have to go into another passage. Just consider that if you would. But we see the Father by, any, by no shadow of doubt. There he is. But keep watching. Then I continue to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. So there's this evil horn that is speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. So now we see that this is giving us a picture of the end times, a beast and a horn, probably representing the Antichrist and the one world government. No other book from Revelation. No, no book does Revelation quote from more than the book of Daniel. You, you listening? The book of Daniel is quoted more in the book of Revelation than any other book, meaning the book of Revelation goes more into depth than what Daniel had. And Daniel had this hundreds of years before Jesus. And here it comes to our point. Uh, verse 12, the other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a certain time. Verse 13, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. Oh, come on, somebody. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power of all people, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. Well, I, I thought they didn't know about Jesus until the New Testament. No, Jesus revealed himself in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, he was prepping the people with prophetic words that get them to understand that in heaven there was more than one person. He was there with the Father. And he is given all authority, all power, and the nations of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. These are some of the songs, by the way, that came out of you know, people celebrating Christmas. Some of these songs represent these days. Joy to the world. This is the day they're talking about. This is the day they're talking. Let the earth rejoice. You keep reading through that. It's talking about judgment, my friends. It's a good song to sing on people's doorsteps. I love it. But if they just understood the lyrics, it would freak them out. We're talking about it's going to be a good day when Jesus sets this place on fire, casts some people to hell, and establishes his eternal kingdom with his father, the Ancient of Days. Now, what am I trying to say here? When you go back to the notes and what we're teaching here and clarifying is that the father did not become Jesus. The Ancient of Days is not the Son of Man. The Son of Man is separate from the Ancient of Days, and yet he receives worship, he receives glory, and he receives a kingdom that never goes away. Well, we have a problem here if we go back to another passage of Scripture. Go to Isaiah chapter 43 quickly. If you love Jesus, let me hear you say amen. Amen. If you don't love paganism, let me hear you say amen. Amen. So we came today to talk about who? Jesus, not paganism. Amen. I have no problem with you celebrating and do whatever you do. That's between you and the Lord. But when you come to this church, you're going to hear about Jesus. You ain't going to hear no story that comes out of some man's teachings. You're going to hear what the Bible says. Amen. This tight, but it's right. I still love you. Hope you love me. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 3. Isaiah 43, verse 3. Isaiah is a, a, a man that came a couple hundred years before Daniel, and he is dealing with the people of Israel that love to worship other gods. And so during this time of worshiping other gods, Isaiah's like, hey, there is no other gods. It's only our God, and nobody gets glory but our God, and nobody has a kingdom but our God that's everlasting, and nobody gets to rule you and watch over you but our God. Why is that a problem? Because in Daniel, we see that it's not just the Ancient of Days that's getting glory. It's somebody called the Son of Man. Now, if the Son of Man is not equally the God of Israel from Isaiah, he is a separate God. And now we have polytheism, and the Bible has just contradicted itself. Are you all tracking with me? I want you to turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 43. Look at it quickly. I don't have time to read it all, but let's just start in verse 11. 
Chapter 43 of verse 11. Let's go to verse 10. We'll go there. Start in verse 10 of Isaiah 43. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my, cho and my servant whom I've chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, and I, not some foreign God among you, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God, yes, and from ancient days I am he. But we go back to Daniel 7. I'm not trying to have you do Bible aerobics, but it's all right to lose some spiritual weight. Amen? Get you fit and trim in the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. Here we go. You read at the end of chapter 7, now you get to verse 14, Daniel 7, verse 14, it says, he was given authority, he was given power, he's given rulership over all people and nations and every language, worship him. His dominion is everlasting, it will never pass away, his kingdom will never be destroyed. Now look at Daniel 7, 15. Daniel 7, 15, what does it say? I, Daniel, was troubled in my spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. Why do you think Daniel got troubled in his spirit? Come on, think. He saw the sun. He saw the sun getting worship. It disturbed him. Hold on. Hold on, there's only one God. There's only one person in God. That's the Father. There's no other persons that share the divinity of God. There's only one person, the Father. And, and, and there cannot be any other God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, he is one. Ahad, in Hebrew, he is one. But now we see the Son coming to the Father, and now there's two. And then we get to the book of John, and Jesus is talking, and he says, hey, there's another just like me, and I'm sending him as well. And so we see there's three. Go to John chapter 14. If you're loving the Bible, say amen. Some of you think this is uh, Bible, uh, you know, acrobats, like I'm trying to show off. No, I'm just trying to teach you who Jesus is, who Jesus is. Don't you think it's important that we should know who Jesus is? Amen. Praise him. Amen. Look at John chapter 14. Look at what Jesus talks about. Go down to John chapter 14. And let's go to verse 16. And I'm going to teach it for you, brother, right here. It's tight, but it's right. Come on. And I will ask the Father. So who's the one talking here in the red? We know this is who? Jesus. So Jesus says, I will ask who? The Father, so now there's the two we know about. Jesus, the Son of Man, according to Daniel's revelation, is going to ask the Ancient of Days something. What is he going to ask him? To give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Father and the Son have another that can be with us forever. Father is with us forever. The Son is with us forever, but yet there is another in the Greek, Elion. And it's not just saying another, like I can send my child or something like this. It is saying another of the same kind. It's like if, you know, this water bottle gets destroyed or something happens to it and somebody says, I'll give you another just like it. Or if your car gets messed up, let's say you drive a Lexus, somebody shows up to you with, uh, you know, some geo prison. You're like, that ain't another of the same kind. I don't want that geo prism. Give me that Lexus. Are you all tracking with me? This Greek word, Elion, means another of the same kind. The spirit of truth is not an angel. The spirit of truth is not an it. The spirit of truth is another divine person of the holy Godhead, the holy God. Are you listening to me? This is where biblical theology comes from. But where the excitement is, as we go back to our notes about Jesus is that Jesus is the one sent to take on flesh. 
The Father never takes on flesh, and the Holy Spirit never takes on flesh. The hypostatic union teaches us that the triune God sent us the Son, and the Son became joined with flesh. This is the incarnation. This is what we also know, as you're going to learn in just a moment, the kenosis, the self-humbling, the emptying of God to do such a thing. Correcting another uh, mistake, number four, Jesus wasn't half God and half man. He was fully God and fully man. What we see that when Jesus walked the earth is he wasn't saying, you know what? I'm no longer God. I'm no longer divine. Now I'm just a man. Or was he saying, you know, I'm half like you and half like the Father? You know, kind of like you see in Greek mythology, you would see like a donkey that had a person's head. It was half a donkey and half a person. Are you listening to me? That's the kind of vulgar example it would be to say it's half God and half man. No, what we see in Jesus is that while he's on earth, he is talking with divine authority. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. When he sees a man that's crippled, before he even heals him, he forgives him of sin. And people go, who can forgive sin but God? And he goes, yeah, God is here through me, healing and setting free. So what we see is that Jesus' nature, watch, is not only unique to us that he is God and man, but he is unique to God. Because no person of the Trinity took on flesh. This is why when we get to Philippians and it says, His name is exalted above every name. That at His knee, every knee shall bow. Uh, I mean, at His throne, every knee shall bow. What we see is that the Father takes delight in His Son becoming man and the Redeemer of mankind. And the Father forever will allow us to glorify Him as a way to give glory to God. You don't glorify the Father unless you glorify the Son. So some people say, you know, I'm not sure about worshiping Jesus, but, you know, I worship Allah, you know, alhamdulillah. You know, I worship Allah. The Muslims say, we worship the Father, we worship the Father. No, the Bible says it's impossible now for you to worship the Father without worshiping Jesus because the Father in sending Jesus to become a man has placed in him all of the worship, all of the authority, and all of the power of the Godhead. He becomes the center of it because... He was crucified for the sins of man. The Father could have kept his glory to himself, but the Father says in Daniel that the Son of Man gets the worship. The Son of Man is the one they serve. Are you all listening to me? The next thing that we want to correct is some things that we hear from Jewish people or Muslim people. They don't understand, you know, that while God was in the flesh as Jesus, he experienced weakness. John chapter 4, 5 says he got tired. He had lack of knowledge, Mark 13, 32. He, he said, I don't know. Even the Son of Man doesn't know when I'll come back. That's why May, uh, December 21st was wrong because the Bible says no one knows the day. Amen. And he, but he said, even the Son of Man doesn't know. So we see that Jesus, while he walked the earth, he had tired. His body got tired. He had lack of knowledge. And, and what people then say is that, he must not have been God because does God get tired? Does God lack knowledge? But what they don't understand is that Jesus willingly set aside, everybody say kenosis, he willingly set aside his privileges as God to be fully man. He never stopped being God, but the Bible says he emptied himself to take the form of a servant. What that means is while he walked on the earth, he tied his divinity hands behind his back. He didn't do the things that God could do in the flesh. He did things fully as a human being in the flesh. But yet, who was he? He was still God. Let me give you an example. When you and I are born, we are born as souls inside of a body, right? We are created at that moment. But our souls have not always existed. Jesus, as a spirit, has always existed. So when he comes into the body, he doesn't stop being who he was. He simply now operates as the body operates. Anybody ever seen the movie Avatar? 
This is actually the Hindu perspective of this because it's always been a part. See, when we talk about comparative religions, why so many things have so much to do with each other, it's because there is one truth and they're all copying from the truth. That's why everybody wants Jesus on their teams. Hindus believe Jesus was an incarnation of Krishna. Muslims believe that he was a prophet. Buddhists believe that he was another Buddha, enlightened one. But Jesus says, I'm all alone by myself, the way, the truth, and the life, and everyone else is a thief and a robber. That's what Jesus said. Now, let me explain this to you. When you just look to the movie as an example, uh, Avatar, Jake Sully, he comes in his body crippled to this planet. He then, through the devices they set up, becomes imparted his mind into a, another body. Are you all listening to me? Then at some point in the movie, after they do the little witchcraft stuff, he then dies in his body, and then his soul is forever joined with the new alien body. Are you guys tracking with me? If you haven't seen the movie, I apologize for using this example for our precious Lord and Savior, but I am trying to help you understand this in a way that is something visual you've already seen. What Jesus did was always exist. He came to this planet like a Jake Sully, like us. And then he never will separate from the fleshly body he has. He will always be that eternal soul called the Son of God, the Logos. But he will now forever have a body. And when they killed his body, it was able to die because it was a body just like yours and mine. But when it was resurrected, it was resurrected as the first fruit, the Bible says, of what your resurrected body will be like. So God became like us to save us and become the first fruit, the example of what us as human beings will be because we are made in his image. And when the devil tried to destroy the Imago Dei, the image of God Jesus said this image is so special I'll die for them so they can forever have it and I will forever relate to it so when you are in heaven your Jesus will look just like you he's a human with a divine soul joined together 100% man 100% God are you all tracking with me if you're ready for the message some may say preach it that was the introduction Starting in verse 6, when we look at this passage, it says, and I'm going to go to verses 1 through 5 at the end because I want to go over this uh, a hymn to Christ first. It says in verse 6, who being in very nature God, what nature was Jesus? Being in very nature what? God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself what? Nothing. But made himself what? Nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. When it says in verse 7, Jesus being in very nature God made himself nothing. Made himself nothing. That phrase is the Greek phrase kenosis. What it means is he being in the very nature God did not have to grasp on to his privileges but made himself nothing by taking on the role and nature of a servant. Do you all see that right there? You see the incarnation. You see the hypostatic union and the kenosis all there in one. I'm going to say it again. He being in very nature God. Who was he before he came to this earth? God. Who was he before the earth was ever created? God. He then made himself nothing. What is that called? That's called the kenosis. God himself said, I will create a body for me to dwell in by the Holy Spirit where I have none of my divine privileges that I have now because I don't have to grasp onto them. I don't have to rob it from God the Father. It's already been given to me. The hypostatic union then happened when he took on the nature of a what? Look at it. Taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So forever he was the nature of 
God, then he humbled himself of divine privileges and at the hypostatic union joined and made himself the very nature of human likeness. Now you understand. What we learn from those two verses is that Jesus already being equal to God doesn't need to grasp his privileges of being God. He was willing to become a man. Thus Jesus made himself nothing by setting aside the divine privileges and becoming limited as a man. This right here, friends, is the greatest miracle ever in the Bible. This is where we should stop and become in awe of who our God is, that our God would limit himself to become a man. The way that, that we could kind of get an example of this would be, imagine you and I take a picture of something. Let's say we're out and uh, we look at some uh, birds in the air and we take a picture of those birds in the air. When we now have this picture, it is maybe like these old Polaroids and we hold this Polaroid like this. When we point to this picture and we look at it, we ourselves are not in the picture, but we're looking at the picture, right? Now imagine if we interjected ourselves into that picture, and now you can see us in the picture. Now you could say, well, here I am. But imagine if we went one step further, and now we looked at this picture as moving pictures becoming a movie, and now we inject ourselves into the movie itself. The whole human history has been playing forth as pictures, as a roll of tape, as it were, as a video. And God's been standing back looking at it. And he's been pointing at it, interacting at it, influencing it. But at the incarnation, he becomes a part of it. This would be like you joining the Simpsons and becoming a cartoon. This would be like you becoming something less than who you've been, but you do it to interact in this. God has always been separate from his creation, looking at creation play out in front of him like a movie or a series of pictures, and he's just looking at it, and he can hold it all in his hands, and he knows the beginning from the end. But what the hypostatic union says is now he actually takes on the characteristics of the very quality of the movie itself. And as weird as it would be for you to become a cartoon, in reality, to think of that, you becoming a cartoon or for you to become a part of a tape is how humbling times a million it was for God who had been outside of this, the creator of this, to then step into this and become a part of this. And then the Bible keeps going. Verse 6, he humbled himself even unto death on the cross. This means he allowed us to then crucify him. So imagine if somehow you could take your soul, put it into the character of a cartoon to totally humble yourself from who you are as a person interacting in the world today, to be in a cartoon limited by what only cartoons can do. But yet in that cartoon, you are put to death by the the other cartoons and yet you feel the pain of it it says verse 8 and being found in appearance as man he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on the cross there's no comparison I've done my best to try to give you us becoming something that we're not interjecting ourselves into a movie or a cartoon but there is really no comparison for this other than just to say this simple statement and then for us to pray and ask God to reveal it to us God what did it mean for you to become a man and die I mean that's a simple statement right we all get that God became a man his body died how do you think it meant uh, to the angels to watch him be struck and to be hurt and, and all of those things. Don't you remember at one point he says, uh, you know, when Peter tries to cut off the ear uh, of, of the soldier that's arresting Jesus, and he says to, to Peter, uh, he says, Peter, if I wanted to, I could call down a legion of angels, 5,000 angels. Now, do you remember in Sodom and Gomorrah, the story there, what two angels did to Sodom and Gomorrah? Two angels destroyed population of 5 million people like this. An angel is basically like an atomic bomb hitting the planet. He said, I could call 5,000 of them right now. What do you think those angels were thinking in heaven as they were watching this? 
their boss, their creator. The, the, the one who made this very creation is now being struck across the face. His beard is being pulled out. They are spitting upon him. Some of you have seen the passion of the Christ. All here should. It's a representation of the physical torture he's going through. And it's not just he's a man going through physical torture because men have been tortured all throughout centuries. But this is the God of creation holding back his divinity and his privileges to step into our world to live on this base level. And yet we are torturing him. Couldn't you imagine what? Michael, the archangel, might have been thinking, Father, send me down right now. I'll destroy them. Father, send me to his aid. He's entered into this, this world as a human and limited himself, but yet I'm still a powerful spirit, an archangel. Let me go into this world and rescue him. Let me step into this place as a spiritual being and drop your punishment, your hell fire upon this place right now. Could you imagine what these angels were thinking from all of eternity? Could you imagine what the saints of heaven were thinking about who had been there prior, worshiping him, adoring him, Moses and Abraham and Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel, and now they're peering over the, the, the side of heaven and they're looking at the one who created them being tortured and punished. Can you imagine this? And yet the Bible says he was obedient to this. And as a man, do you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know what he said? He said, Father, if there is any other way for me to do this, take this cup from me. Why? Because God in the flesh, knowing that no divine privilege would save him, that this was going to be the most humiliating experience, not of just his life, but of all human history. They are going to crucify and torture the Lord of creation. He says, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. And the Bible says he prayed with so much passion that drops of blood come from his pores. And medical scientists have found out that someone under excruciating stress and, and gritting their teeth and having physical despair could at some point cause their body to perspire blood. And at that moment, you can see just the Father in heaven not being able to take it. And he just says, angels minister to him right now. Just go to him right now. And the Bible says angels enter in and they minister to him. Could you imagine what that conversation would have been like? Because they talk and communicate. Could you imagine what the angels would have said to him? Because it says they minister to him. They might have said, is, is your creation worth this Savior? Yahweh. Are they worth all of this? You've punished our own race, the angels, to dooms, uh, to dungeons and pits of hell. You've not redeemed them. You've cast out Lucifer once and for all. Are these people worth you suffering now? Are they worth you shedding your blood for all of heaven to watch this? Are they worth this? Is this creation worth it? And you can almost just imagine Jesus saying yes. And that's why when Jesus was on that cross, see, we should do better to remember him there than as a baby because he came as a baby to go there. And it says he humbled himself to the point of death. They're cursing, they're yelling, they're hollering at him. Yet there's a man on the side of him that begins to get a revelation. This is not like any other man. He's not a normal man. And the thief on the cross, he gets convicted and he shouts over to Jesus as he himself has died. And he says, today, man, Master, will you remember me in paradise? And Jesus shows his love and compassion for us so much that he looks over to that man and he says, Today, you'll be with me in paradise. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
The sky turns black at three in the afternoon and he cries out the words of David in Psalms 22 in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? The Father couldn't bear to watch the sacrifice continue. He shuts off the heavenly lights. The place becomes black. And for the first time in human history, the Son who's always been with the Father, the joy of His Father, sent from His Father, everything is together in union. The Father now places all of sin upon His Son who was made flesh and allows Him to suffer the same rejection and punishment that Adam did at the Garden of Eden. And then Jesus at these moments carries, Isaiah says, 53, carries all of your sorrows, carries all of your sin, and carries all of your sickness. This baby that was born in a manger had come for such a time as this, had lived his life sinless to become a lamb sacrifice slain for us, and there he breathes out his last breath. It is finished. And at that moment, the gates of hell shook. Jesus defeated the devil three days later resurrected and he said all authority is mine and that's why it says in verse 9 therefore God exalted him to the highest place this God man Jesus in the divinity of eternity was already there but now in a fleshly body, in this new hypostatic union, he is now made the center of the Godhead's worship. How do we worship you, God? How do we please you? You worship my son, the one who took on flesh, who died for you and rose again. You worship him, therefore God the Father exalted him and gave him the name that is above Every name. What's his name? Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. That's about everybody, isn't it? And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lastly, when we look here at Jesus Christ being confessed Lord, there is no other way to look at it that Lord is the divine name given to the God of the Old Testament known in the Tetragrammaton, which is this Yahweh, Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is Jehovah our God. And then it says to the glory of of God the Father, that when we worship Jesus, the Father gets the glory. Why would the Father get glory? Let me just help you understand what glory means. Glory means praise and honor, but it also has to do with praise and honor in the sense of a reputation. Everybody say reputation. The reason why all of this, well, we talked about the incarnation, the hypostatic union, the kenosis, and then the sacrifice of Jesus brings glory to the reputation of God the Father is because when he created mankind through Jesus, the image, we became replicas in our image of Jesus, not being divine like Jesus, but replicas. When we sinned against him, at that point, Satan, we see it in the book of Job, began to accuse now the Father and began to say things like this, that you made these people, you gave them a choice. I came down in the form of a serpent. They chose me over you. I rebelled against you. They rebelled against you. No one will choose you. The accuser began to go before God with these kind of accusations about mankind. You can't create angels that will follow you because they all rebel. You can't create mankind to follow you because they rebel. They'll choose their sexual immorality over you every time. They'll choose their greed over you every time. Just like we in a third of heaven chose our sin over you, your creation has chosen their sin over you. But you see, when we look at mankind in the redemption story, we see that it is for the reputation 
the glory of the Father. What does that mean? Something like this might have happened. We don't know exactly, but something like this probably happened where Jesus said, they will choose you if we now set them free from their sin and give them one more chance. Let them be born again. Let them be born again, and they this time will choose you. They will see that their first choice was death. Their first choice was sin. Through redemption, we can give them another choice, and there will be a people who choose you. There will be a called-out group that will want you to be their God. Send me, I'll go. You see, the Bible says before the creation of the world, Jesus was the lamb slain. Because in heaven's mind, for the reputation of God to be a master creator, to be a master workmanship in creation, he knew that by giving us a choice, he would have to send his son to die to redeem us from that choice so that we could choose him, those who now know good from evil. And so when Jesus died on the cross and you now choose him, and you say, I'm not going to live a life of sin. I'm not, I'm not going to go the way of the devil. I know the difference now between good and evil. I know what this world is like because of evil. I know what sin brings. I know what temptation leads to. I know all of these things, but I choose Jesus. Every time you bow your knee here and you choose Jesus, you give glory to the Father. Every time you choose to live your life for Jesus Christ and for the commands of God, you give him glory. And then on the last day, my friends, the last day, the judgment day, because it says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. On that day, everyone will say it. We had a choice between good and evil, but we chose evil. But your way was better. I can see now your way was better. Everybody will say it. Romans 10, 17, those who confess now are saved. You will confess then on the day of judgment day who he is. He is God, the creator. You will confess that your knee will bow, but you will not be saved. You will understand that good triumphs evil. That day you will understand who Christ Jesus is. You will see physical hands that are marked with the cross to forever identify him as our Savior. You will see that. You will bow before him. You will confess him as the good God that he is, but you'll be cast into the lake of fire. Those who confess him now are the ones that are saved. Those who confess him now are the ones who he comes and dwells with. Those who confess him now are given the benefits of his kingdom, the fruit of the Spirit, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's those who come to him now that overcome the evil one, become more than conquerors, have an abundant life. It is those today. Is there anybody here who doesn't just choose a baby Jesus, but a crucified, resurrected, Lord as the Lord of their life if that's you can you say amen as you stand to your feet come on somebody Ben would you come it's those today who can go home to their children cut up a sliced ham fill a stocking and still make December 25th meaningful it's people who understand that because if you don't understand that, December 25th is like any other day. And all of these putrid things our American culture does will burn in fire the day he comes. Children, the greatest Christmas presents your parents gave you was the house you sleep in, the bed you have, and the clothes you wear, and the food you eat. Shame on you if you demand one other thing from your parents. They're good parents because they've provided those things for you. Shame on any of us here. If we take the day that we remember him coming and giving up everything because he gave up his divine privileges, how dare we take that day and make it the day we get everything? Are you all listening to me? Paul said, with this in mind, let this attitude be in you that was in Christ Jesus. As you're standing here today in closing, I want to give you three things to remember. 
avoid a bad attitude in life and have the attitude of Christianity, the attitude of Christ. Because we got some attitudes in life, don't we? We've got some gender attitudes. Any women here got some woman sass? When I was first uh, dating my wife, I met a brother who was just a little bit further along with me, and he said, there's a certain time of the month where mama ain't going to be happy, and you're going to have to go beyond, beyond to make her happy. And when he taught me that, I realized there was some gender pride, some gender attitude, because once my wife hit that time of the month and I didn't say the, the right thing, it all came out. But how many know there's also some man pride, women? There's, there's some man pride. Well, you can't tell me nothing. I'm the man of this house. I'm going to do it my way. Try to help a man on the job. Oh, no, no, I got this. I got this. I go to the gym, you know, and men trying to help others. No, I got it. I got it. You know, about ready to drop it on themselves. Not only is there gender attitude, there's also age attitude. You got young people think they know it all. I love that little saying that it says, all teenagers here, listen to me. It says, if you know everything, your parents are dumb, you need to move out right now before you figure out how little you do know. I love that. So teenagers with your pride, you know, you yeah, got like one teenager here today. God bless you. You're going to catch all this couple of y'all. You're going to catch it all. They should have been here. Are you? No, my room ain't dirty. My room ain't dirty. You know your room is dirty. Clean that thing. But you know what? It's not only young people that have pride as an, as an age pride. It's also older people. You know, some of the hardest people for me to disciple in this church are people older than me. Pastor, I know more than you. I've been around longer than you. I've jacked up my life more than you. We have attitudes about our gender. I'm a man. I'm a woman. We've got attitudes about being young. I'm young, and I know everything. And the attitudes about being old. I know everything. You ain't going to teach me nothing. And then we got cultural attitudes. We got attitudes like, I'm Italian. This is just how we talk. That's what my mom used to say as my friends complained about hearing us yell down the block. Cultural attitudes. And then, and then me coming from a Polish background, my dad, he would tell it to me once, tell it to me again, tell it to me the third time. And he would say, listen, I'm just going to tell you one more time. So we made up this statement that's called being Polish with me. Dad, I got it. Now, Nancy knows it because I'll tell her one time, another time, and another time. Now, I don't know about you, but I just told on myself, Italian pride, Polish pride. But is there anybody else here that got their own pride? Maybe Puerto Rican pride, Mexican pride, German pride. Come on, some pride in our races. And not only just like where we come from, but our country. Do you know that Americans, we act prideful when we drive? When we go to other countries and we order stuff at restaurants, they think we're so prideful. I was in India, India, and it didn't matter if we were Mexican, white. They just looked at us all American because we all acted so prideful. And then you know what? Not only have we got them kind of attitudes, we've got sinful attitudes. Well, there's nothing wrong with this. You know, the Bible understands. I'm a sinner, so I'm going to keep doing this. Men make excuses for pornography. Women make excuses for bitterness. Everybody seems to make excuses for jealousy unforgiveness well they don't deserve to be forgiven they you know i'm gonna be angry at them you know what the bible says let this attitude be in you that was in christ jesus why should we change our attitude to fit that of christ jesus because christ jesus shows us that when he gave up everything it resulted in people being blessed if we want to be a blessing to this world, we need to give up our attitudes and be like Christ. This is what the Bible says. It says, if you have any encouragement, being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Everybody say like-minded. Husbands and wives should be like-minded. Church members should be like-minded with their leadership. You should be like-minded on your job and support that which they're doing. We should be like-minded with the laws of our land. Having the same love, the church should, should have the love of Christ. We should all share it together. And we should be one in spirit and in purpose. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Everybody say, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Some may say, or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. Do you know that you and I are commanded 
during this time to consider others better than ourselves. That we are not to do things out of selfish ambition. Well, Pastor, that's what I do when I buy my kids gifts. Whose kids are they, Jack? My kids. Do you buy my kids gifts? No, well, then you're being selfish. You buy your kids gifts. You buy your wife gifts. See, the Bible says prefer others above yourself. You might say, Pastor, that sounds weird. I won't buy your wife a gift. Well, I think if you're going to prefer somebody above yourself, you better get to it. I ain't buying gifts, so I ain't got to worry about it. But if you're buying gifts, why does it say do nothing out of vain, conceit, selfish ambition? It's all about me. It's about my family. It's about what I get. It's about who knows what I give. God have mercy on our nation. You can take it or not. I'm still giving it. Amen. And then lastly, this is what he says. He says, each of you should look not to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So what should we have as an attitude around this time? Well, I'm not doing stuff for selfish ambition. I'm not doing stuff just for myself and the people I love. I'm doing stuff for others. But not only that, I'm supposed to be interested in what other people are going through. I'm supposed to be interested in what their mind is suffering during this time or their heartaches and their pains. That's the truth. And he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. I want to challenge you during this Christmas season, just like I challenged you during election season, to have the attitude of Christ. It's up to you how you do that. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to say you can't give a gift on a certain day and you can't decorate your house a certain way. That's not my job to judge you. But it is my job to preach to you. I want you to check your attitude. I want you to ask yourself, do you have the attitude of Christ or are you walking around with pride and vain conceit making life all about you? If this is really about Christ, put your heart towards others. Put your attitude towards his attitude and be a servant, even if it hurts you, even if people reject you. Look to Jesus as your example for having the right attitude when people treat you wrong and you suffer. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. I pray you change our hearts and our attitudes to be like you today, God. Would you take a few moments and look at your attitude? The theological message is supposed to hit your heart practically today. Look at your life. Do you have the attitude of Christ? Show us our hearts, God. Show us our greed. Show us our pride. And make us like you, Jesus. Some of you are so offended about Christmas, you can't even hear the message anymore, but you need to. Come on, I'm going to take a few moments. You need to hear it right now. Check your attitude. When I think of the birth of Christ, I think about that passage. And the application is, what is my attitude like? So if you're going to think about the birth of Christ, I'm going to adjure you for the next five minutes to check your attitude as you think about the birth of Christ. Didn't say nothing there about gifts. Didn't say nothing about cookies. Didn't say nothing about Santa Claus. It said your attitude should be the same of Christ Jesus who joined himself to flesh, humbled himself of his divine privileges, and died on the cross for our sins. Your attitude should be like that. God, I pray you start in me. Show me my attitude, my cultural attitude, my man attitude, my sinful attitude. Whatever's not like you, Jesus.
Take it out today. Altar workers, would you come, please? We're going to close out in prayer just a few more moments for you to check your attitude. If Christ could die on the cross for you, you can humble yourself and obey his commands. If Christ could die on the cross as a man, you and I can treat people with respect, be humble, honor one another, be of the same purpose. You know why, just with head bowed and eyes closed, you know why your pastor gets so ticked off around this time? is because everybody goes to these churches and they all, nobody gets the real message and they all hear the same baloney every month, every, every, every year. They're Christers. It just blows my mind how somebody can tell me they're a Christian. They went to church on Christmas and yet their attitude is nothing like Christ. Their life is nothing like Christ. And then we have pimping, profiting, professional, politician, pastors pacify the people. Just come here on Christmas. I'll give you some communion. I'll tell you about little baby Jesus and how he loves you. And let's just make a couple jokes about Santa Claus. And you go back to hell as you came. And you go back to a jacked up family as you came. And you go back to deceiving yourself as you came. Don't bother about the Lordship. Don't bother about bending your knee. Don't bother about changing your attitude. You just stay as jacked up as you are. But thank you for coming on Christmas. We had your children sing. We gave you a gift. Put a candy cane in your stocking. Every head bowed a few more moments. You know what my wife told me while she was weeping over the, the shootings in Connecticut? You know what she was telling me? She said that these would have been teenagers. Most of them would be in hell right now. She says, we are living in a time with so much tragedy, but people have no understanding that the greatest strategy, the strategy is that people are going to hell. That means teenagers, they come to an age of accountability. They understand in their conscience right from wrong. And my wife said to me with tears going down her eyes, could you imagine being wrongfully murdered and yet going to hell? I remember talking to somebody during Mardi Gras. He was a Jewish man. His family had, had, had suffered in the Holocaust. His grandma had died in the gas chambers. He grabbed me by my collar. He got up in my face, and he said, where did my grandma go when she died? If you're telling me that your God would send my grandma to hell, I'm going to beat you up right now. You see, because for the Jew, the Muslim, everybody else, there is no way to the Father but through the Son. And he said, where's my grandma? And I said, this is what the word of God says. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through the Son. If your grandmother did not come through the Son, she is not in heaven with him. And he just looked at me, let go of me, and just walked away. But you know what? They don't always do that in other nations. Sometimes people die and they suffer persecution. But I stood in front of this man as angry as he was, and I told him the truth. I said, unless they bow their knee to Jesus. Jews in the Holocaust, uh, you know, uh, young adults dying in Dofar, it doesn't matter, my friends. You are living in a world where the Bible says the gates are wide that lead to destruction, but narrow that lead to heaven. And the Christian, the supposed Christian of America, over almost 80% of us will go to church this week and hear something other than that. That's why I'm upset, okay? But I want us now to pray 30 seconds for our friends and family that you'll be seeing this week and maybe you'll give them a gift. I don't know what you do for Christmas. That's none of my business. But I want you to pray 30 seconds that you will explain this in the way that they can understand. You will explain the gospel to your relatives. You will explain the gospel of Jesus Christ, his incarnation, his death for man's sins, and the change of attitude and the change of how we live that we're 
we're supposed to do in response. 30 seconds right now for your relatives to hear the message and for boldness for you to preach it. Father, I pray for boldness on our lives. God, let not these moments pass us by. I pray we will be witnesses to our friends and family. God, because their souls are at stake, Jesus. Heaven and hell is at stake, Jesus. Oh, be with my sister-in-law, Vicki, God. Save her. Open her eyes, Jesus. Change her attitude, Jesus. Change my future brother-in-law, Nick, God. Save him, Jesus. Save him, oh God. Let him not perish. Let him not go to hell, Jesus. Spare him, God. Let him bow his knee on this earth to you, Jesus. He has enough sense, God, to know his right from his wrong. I pray, God, he senses your conviction and he repents of his sins, Lord. Let every knee bow in Chicago here today to you, Jesus. We pray for revival. We pray for revival. We pray for revival. We pray, God, that every person that put a manger in their front yard, they will bow their knees to you, not as a baby, but as the Lord Yahweh. We pray for a revival, God, of attitude change, of mindset change in this city, God, during this time, God. It's not about things. It's about you, Jesus. It's about you, God. You bled and died for us, Lord. You rose again for us, for the reputation of your Father, for his reputation of a good God. He has created us, and it is well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Have mercy on this nation. Save our land. Woo! Hallelujah! All across this place, would you hold somebody's hand, please? Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Come on across these aisles. Oh, Jesus. Christmas needs to come more often. I want you all to look up at me, please. Thank you for hearing me preach to you today the Word of God. I do it because I love you, not because I'm angry at you. And I just pray that this church would be the kind of church that has a reputation that we acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. That that would be our reputation. Yeah, we may sing songs next year. I don't know. I mean, every year it changes around here. But, I mean, it's like, hey, you know what? If you want to go somewhere on Christmas or the week before, or whatever, you want to hear about Jesus, you go to Metro Praise. You want to live like Jesus? You want to have your life change to be like Jesus? Go to one of their life groups. You want to learn to change the world like Jesus? Start their discipleship. May not be many of them. May not be a lot of them. But when you meet them on the streets... When you hear about them on the job, when you see their young people, they are followers of Christ. They are giving glory back to the Father. For the reputation of the Father, they are out here doing what he did. That's my prayer for you, Father. I pray we all become your fathers, followers of your son, Jesus. Father, for your reputation, may we all be your disciples. May no one walk out of here with some wrong understanding about me and Christmas. It's not my issue. My issue is how Christians live for Christ. May that be what sets in our heart and sets us apart. In your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, can everybody say amen. Let's bless him.